Good morning. I guess we're starting early in the new year. We got two minutes, so we could just, what? We'll start early. We'll start early. Maybe, no, no, that's good. We're good. I, welcome in, I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome each and every one of you as we gather to glorify our risen Lord. For those on Zoom and YouTube later on in the day, we rejoice. Uh, that we are here today praising and glorifying our risen Lord. So I want to welcome each and every one of you. A couple of announcements. Uh, those that uh, might not have heard, is that, but I sent an email out to everyone, is that Russ Stobie passed away, and his service will be at Jefferson Memorial uh, Funeral Home uh, tomorrow at noon. Uh, the viewing will be from 10 to 12, so uh, that is where uh, we want to keep the Stobie family in our prayers. We also want to keep uh, Bethany uh, and Andrew, that is uh, Mike and Donna Carney's uh, daughter and son-in-law, uh, as uh, there is a, a little complication in the pregnancy near the end. Hopefully it will resolve itself by uh, January 20th. It's when uh, Bethany is due. Uh, so we want to keep uh, the, that entire family in our prayers as well. Uh, again, you can see in your bulletin on the very front page, there is our a prayer request. can be sent to text to 412-440-7729. Uh, uh, you can do it now if you want. Uh, if there's any prayers that you want to make sure I bring up here, and uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to hear from you if you have a prayer on your a heart. Uh, any other announcements? I think we've got some in the back. Go ahead. Good morning. The deacons are starting out the new year with our Socks for the Homeless project. We will be collecting men's, women's, and children's socks to benefit the homeless at the Light of Life Mission and the McKeesport Homestead Shelters. Please help us provide warmth to the vulnerable Pittsburgh homeless, many who spend their days outside in the elements. A donation box has been placed outside the library, and we will be collecting socks through January 22nd. Thank you. Thank you, Pearl. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year to everyone. On behalf of the Reach Out Group, I want to thank everyone from the church who supported us for our Advent blessing boxes. I am happy to announce that we made 11 households Christmases this year. We packed enough boxes to support seven of our needy families from our church family and four families from Kids at Heart. Each box received between 45 and 55 non-perishable items, so we made lots of people very happy this holiday. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Let's give uh, the Reach Out group, and everyone's contributed a round of applause. Thank you all so much. Any other announcements? Yes. I have a couple of announcements I need to make this morning. If you are a chair of a committee uh, and you have a book to turn in, we absolutely, positively, definitely need that immediately. Um, the audit, we want to have that on the 15th of January. And it's, it's, so it's very important for you to get your books in. Um, something else I'd like to bring to your attention is that I heard from Hiroko Zaprinsky and out on the piano that we're not supposed to touch, um, I put a card, I put her card, and um, she sent um, a, like a little newsletter along for you. So if you would take a moment to stop and read that, I, I'm sure you'll be blessed by that. The other thing I need to um, ask you about or bring to your attention is uh, Tommy and Debbie Bekovac. Debbie has spent um, over a month in the hospital with COVID. She's out of the hospital and she's doing better, but she has a long way to go. She is currently at what used to be Lawson Nursing Home, which is now um, something from UPMC. Tommy said that um, Debbie would really appreciate some visitors. If you know Debbie, um, it would be nice if you could stop in for just a couple of minutes even, just to say hello and how are you doing, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, cards, cards would also be a nice gesture. The other thing, um, we would like to do the church undecorating on the 14th of January. So if you're available, 
um, all hands on deck, and that would be a nice blessing for all. So thank you. What time, Kate? Um, we usually meet around 9.30 or 10 o'clock, between 9.30 and 10 o'clock for the undecorating. So 9.30, 10 o'clock, undecorating January 14th. Right. Super. Any other announcements? Not seeing any, then let us set ourselves on the worship of God. Let us join together in our responsive call to worship. Yet the Ephraimites sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table for the wilderness? He struck the rocks so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger rose against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his saving power. Yet, Yet he commanded the skies above and opened, and opened the, the doors, doors of, of heaven. heaven. And he and rained himself. down on them manna to eat and gave them grain of heaven. Let, Let us, us worship, worship God. God. Let us go to God in unison and ask for his mercy and grace. Lord of Christmas Day and every day, we rejoice in celebration of the new year 
and, the and blessings that you have bestowed on us in 2022. Forgive us the times we worked against your will for us and help us to instead flow your will in 2023. All through the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Christian friends, we can often think that it's all about us, and that is the nature of sin. But the truth is, it is all about Jesus Christ. And as we turn our hearts to, hearts, to, hearts to Christ, God helps us know that we have been forgiven. So hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us remain standing and affirm what we believe by sharing together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray that God will open our hearts and minds. God Almighty, in all things, you have knowledge and wisdom and that far exceeds our abilities. Open our hearts and minds to seek and to see the truth that you provide in your holy word so that we can take it out into the world with joy and celebration in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first lesson is from Matthew um, chapter 23, verses uh, 23 to 33. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, I'm sorry, you blind guides straining out a an gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, then the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. 
So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the mountain, the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of, the, of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? May the Lord bless this reading and our understanding of his most holy word. So, um, I was just going to say, you don't look a lot like Mike Carney. So, it's <laughs> when you have to step in at the last minute and things like that. Well, I have another little sidestep. Um, I had a video for this morning, but we had a miscommunication. So, you're going to get a special treat. I'm going to play something for you this morning instead. So I said, this is, you know, when you can improvise, you know, you learn how to just roll with things in life. Um, I just wanted to say a really quick um, Happy New Year to everybody. Um, how many of you made New Year's resolutions by a show of hands? So, because <laughs> a lot of times now you make a resolution, you know it's going to be broken in two weeks. So it's, it's interesting to see that nobody in here made a New Year's resolution. So I, I was talking to a friend of mine and they, they were saying, you know, last week, yeah, when the new year comes, I, you know, wanted a change of attitude or, you know, things like that. And I said, well, you know, you don't have to wait for the new year to change your attitude. You can do that now. But it's so, so funny how the new year, we just think this is a new start for things. You know, this is going to be the new beginning type of thing. So today's your day. Today's your day to start whatever you were <laughs> putting off before. This is our new beginning. So I'm going to play Carol of the Bells for you.
Our scripture this morning comes from Romans 14, verses 13 through 23. There is a couple of mistakes in the bulletin. I did not want to start the new year off saying, hey, we're perfect. Well, we're not. We're right off the bat. We got some mistakes. Uh, but we'll address that. So what we are preaching is Romans 14, 13 uh, to the end of the chapter, 23. So here are these words. The Apostle Paul tells the Romans, Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone who makes another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blesses the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I must admit, you got to love that picture. I don't know if you like camels, but that's a great picture of a camel. You know, and the title, Don't Swallow Camels or Don't Eat Camels, will come clearer later on. Now, you can look at this and you can realize that is not the message that's in here. So that's mistake number two. So let me read what's in the bulletin because that is the real sermon uh, takeaway. Christ has called us to seek his will and purpose, but sometimes in self-righteousness and pride, we believe that we know not only what God has called us to do, but what God is calling everyone else to do. We are often wrong. As I said uh, last week, uh, this, is a, this is the second part of that two-part series. So we're going to first off start with uh, the spiritual milk of the passage. That's camel milk, by the way. Now, some interesting facts about camels, because, you know, knowing that camels are, are important, you know, camels were considered the ships of the desert. They were the biggest animals that the, the people in the desert would know. You could, have, uh, you could have goats, you could have sheep, you could even have cows, but they were not nearly as big as camels. Camels were, you know, perfectly made for the desert because of, their, uh, because of their ability to go long distances without water, long distances without food. Uh, their bodies were just literally built for that. They're very social animals. Uh, they, the most expensive camel was sold for $53 million, you know, a little more than a Lamborghini, you know. Uh, there are 160 different words for camel in Arabic. Uh, they can live for up to 50 years. And... Uh, their humps don't really store water, their humps store fat. That's why they can go so long without eating, and when that fat's depleted, the hump just falls over. So, that, as Nancy said this morning when I was talking to her about that tidbit of information, she said, oh, that's sad. And I said, well, as soon as they start eating, hump goes back up. So, good. They actually store their water in their blood. That's why, again, they can go long distances. So, we know about camels. Did, raise your hand if you knew all that stuff. Anybody? That was good. So that's information that if you walk away with nothing today, you can walk away with some really good information about camels. But we have to look at what that really applies to. It applies to us. How are, do we see ourselves? And how do we see ourselves as different or similar to others? Are we individuals? Are we uh, part of the social order? Are we like other people? Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, I care not what others think of what I do, but I care very much about what I think of what I do. 
For him, he says that is character. So for Theodore Roosevelt, he's talking about, he says, you know, what other people think of what I do is not so important. Is, am I comfortable with what I'm doing? And if you look at the difference in the world, a lot of people need to be comfortable with what they're do, doing because the world is full of a lot of different people. Do you know, at the year's end, as of yesterday, anyone want to guess what the world's population is? 7.9 billion people. 7.9, almost 8. You know, so 7.9 billion people, and among that, they differ in so many ways. Genetic makeup, social, cultural background, spiritual background, attitudes, the way they speak, listen, learn, behave, act, and react. People are different. People, even we in this room today, though many of us are reformed in theology, material, government, uh, would have different variations of what we believe and how we live that out. Does God care about those differences? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Because what does God care about? Does God care that we are different people and that some may have one way of doing things and another might have another way of doing things? What is God concerned about? So we look at this one passage that we want to lift out of the larger passage we'll do when we get to the spiritual meat. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who served Christ in this way is pleasing in God and approved by men. This is the essence of what we're talking about. We're called to serve others like Christ has served us. And when we do this, this is what is pleasing to God. And who are the others? Who are we serving? You'll love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, but you'll love your neighbor as yourself. So we have to again go back to what does it mean to love your neighbor? Loving your, na loving your neighbor does mean loving those people who don't look like you, think like you, love like you, speak like you, pray like you, vote like you, Love your neighbor, there are no exceptions. Now, you might look at that list and go, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know about that. Though you might not agree with what other people do, that 7.9 billion uh, group that we're talking about, minus one yourself, we're still supposed to love them no matter who they are, no matter what they do. And this is difficult. And that's why we have wars. And sometimes it's hard to love those that you don't know. But we are supposed to not just love them, but respect them. To respect the other is very difficult, but it's what we're called to do. And this is what a life pleasing to God is all about. To love those that are different from you, despite their differences. So now, that was the spiritual milk. Let's go to the spiritual meat. And apparently, camel meat is very tasty. So I can't really speak to that, having never tried it myself. But let's go to the Romans passage 13 through 23. So Paul continues from the last week. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. And Sid, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister. Think about that. How often do we put that stumbling block? Sometimes we put a stumbling block just by being happy. Sometimes we uh, put a stumbling block by just being glum. Sometimes we put a stumbling block because we're judgmental. Is this the witness we want to share with others? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Or is this a poor witness? Some people can think, I'm a better Christian than anybody else really got everything down. But do you? Remember it was a passage that Kate selected? I don't know why Kate selected that passage. I mean, it ended in hell. It was talking about whitewashed tombs. Wow. Anyway, by going with what Kate read, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were considered the religious of the religious, the ones who really got it. They weren't like the Sadducees, the ones who it was all about cooperating with the Romans. They were the ones who knew the law, 
who read the law, who taught the law, who got it, and they were able to just share it at a moment's notice. Okay, that sounds good. But apparently, they were getting it wrong. Because, gee, this, the, the part that Kate read was called the seven woes, and all directed against the Pharisees. Whoa, whoa on you. Whoa, that looks bad too. And the part that they were doing, that they were making judgments on others, setting obstacles in the way of their fellow Jews. They, they were, it wasn't even a matter of non-Jews. In their fellow Jews, they were setting obstacles in the way of. And so Jesus was saying, woe to them because they look good. They look great. They're like a tomb. On the outside, it looks super. On the inside, it's full of dead things. So we have to ask ourselves, that's a question we all, all, often have to come back to. Are we whitewashed tombs? Are we Pharisees? Or are we still recognizing in humility our own sinfulness and not passing judgment on others because we have all sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God? Now, some might say, we go, well, should Christians really care what unbelievers think of them? Should we? They're unbelievers. I love this. It's St. Peter. Again, I don't think St. Peter's standing in front of the pearly gates. I like this cartoon. He's telling this uh, individual, you were a believer, yes, but you sort of skipped the not being a jerk about it part. <laughs> How often do we skip that part? A Christian's behavior is the first sermon and witness a non-believer sees. It's the first sermon they see when they look at us and they know we're a Christian because we either tell them or because it is obvious. We got our Jesus uh, stickers or we got our Jesus thing on our car. How often have you seen someone flip you off, pass you by, and you see a Jesus sticker on the back of their car? That's a great witness. Are we a stumbling block or are we a stepping stone? We are called to be a stepping stone, not a stumbling block, not to put obstacles in front of others, and especially brothers and sisters in faith. Not to put a stumbling block in front of anyone, but especially brothers and sisters in faith. So Paul continues to say, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ had died. This is a mind over matter thing. It really talks about, I mean, Paul's focusing on food. Because when he's talking to the Romans and he talks to other, the other churches as well, is that so often that people were thinking that the food they were eating was, if they were sacrificed to idols, they couldn't eat it. So they would not eat most meat. They wouldn't want to eat the meat sacrificed or uh, killed by Jews if they weren't a Jew. So Gentiles were really going the whole uh, vegan and vegetarian route. But there were some who said, you know, and Paul was one of them, there are no other gods. So you might be sacrificing to this false god, but it's not a god, so the meat's fine. What Paul's now saying, is that really about what you want? Or is it about what is best for the community and best for the other? How is what you do impacting the other? How is that an obstacle? And that's where a lot of this whole camel stuff, the, 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 the thing about camels is coming in. Camels were seen as unclean. Whether or not camel milk is tasty and whether or not camel meat uh, is good, Camels were seen as unclean. So the Jews would not eat camels. They wouldn't even use camels to a great degree once the law happened because they were unclean. But there were those who wouldn't eat camels, and there were those who would drink milk from camels. As Christians, were they being unrighteous or were they being righteous? Now, I don't know, if we had suddenly a pitcher of camel milk out there, how many would pour some in their coffee? Raise your hand. We got one. 
And then, oh, we got two. We got Andy back there. Okay. So I guess I'm not going to bring camel milk in. What about camel milk? We had a big old camel roast out there. How many try that? Okay, now we got some more hands. Good, good. I would try, I try it too. But it didn't make, would it make us better than those who wanted it, and it wouldn't make those who didn't better than us. But unfortunately, in the infancy of faith, some might think so. So who would be called to give up what they would want to do? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.22, To the weak I became weak in order to gain the weak. I become all things to all people so that by all means I may save some. Paul makes it clear. I'm, I'll give up what I, what I might want to do in order to become more faith. I'll become weak like them in order to share my faith so they will understand who Jesus Christ is and then through that become stronger. There was a woman named Sidney Wright who said, sometimes people hurt us unintentionally. We may view that, view that they've hurt us intentionally and want revenge, but sometimes when we really look back again, we can see that they weren't intentional in trying to hurt us. That's when we need to confess our judgment of them and forgive them for the unintentional hurts committed against us. If suddenly we did have a pitcher of camel meat or camel uh, milk back there, and you saw Andy and Bob, you know, pouring some of their coffee or just having their big old single glass of milk. Some of you might say, yeah, they're freaks. Or they might find, if there's a real big opposition in the church, I need to forego camel milk. Who should be the one giving up? The answer is, as Christians, we should always seek to be the one not to intentionally hurt When we unintentionally hurt someone, or we are unintentionally hurt, we need to forgive and to seek understanding and seek a better way of interacting with one another. And that is by leading with love. Hating other people is easy because people are always making mistakes and we're only human. Let's just love each other through that. Love each other through that whatever, whenever we get the chance. We need to lead in love with whatever we do. That attitude of suspicion or attitude of anger or attitude of hate directed to those who don't think like us, who don't act like us, who aren't us. Paul continues to say, then don't let your good be slandered, for God's kingdom is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I want to emphasize that because that is what it's about. It's about seeking peace and seeking the joy in the Holy Spirit. We're going in a different direction that isn't really good. C.S. Lewis says, When we merely say that we are bad, the wrath of God seems a barbarous doctrine. As soon as we perceive our badness, it appears inevitable, a mere corollary from God's goodness. Meaning, if we truly recognize who we are, we're not looking at the doctor as the wrath of God as something that would not impact us. We're looking at the wrath of God that could impact us. And so our sense of seeking righteousness and peace and joy should be more prevalent in our mind. Jonathan Edwards, a renowned Reformed preacher back in the 1700s, said it's not by telling people about ourselves that we demonstrate our Christianity. Words are cheap is by costly self-denying Christian practice that we show the reality of our faith. Paul was all about that, helping us to understand that we are called to be self-denying in our, in our faith by ensuring that we do not put the obstacles in front of other people, the stumbling blocks would cause other people who Christ died for between themselves and Christ. Now, Romans continues to say, if you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. That's that whole attitude versus behavior, attitude versus action. Do you know that if you change your action, your attitude can often follow? People say, well, you know, I don't like that person. Well, that's fine. It's better you love them. 
What do you mean? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. Love endures all things, hope all things, believes all things, love never ends. If you do that towards those that you don't like, those are action. Those are verbs, action items. If you do that, then before you know it, your attitude towards them will not be one of hate or dislike, but one of love. Because attitude often follows action. Paul continues to say, we are to promote peace, not our pride, so don't hold grudges. With hold forgiveness and grace, or find sick joy in other suffering. So then we must pursue what promotes peace and what builds one another up. We need to be fixed on Jesus. No matter what we do, all, all our entire being needs to be fixed on what Jesus has called us to do. You know, Lisa was talking about New Year's res resolutions. And apparently, in our church, we don't got anybody who's made a New Year's resolution. Well, that's fine. That's absolutely fine, because as she also said, we should be uh, seeking that righteousness each and every day. So that's what you're all doing. Super. But we need to do that each and every day. We need to seek that righteousness and make every effort to keep fixed on Jesus and what Christ has called us to do. And that means we must lead with the humility of love, even against those, even towards those who we might not like and who certainly might not. That is how we share our love. That's that self-denying practice that we're called to have. That's how becoming, that allows us to become weak in order to lead others to Jesus. And by doing so, we lift each other up, not tear each other down. And that is what we should be doing as Christians. So Paul continues to say, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or anything else that will cause your brother to fall. Look to 94. It's not all about you. Have you ever heard that? It's not about you, and then you say, I wonder if they're talking about me. <laughs> you know, it's not all about you. So Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. If you make it all about you and all about your concerns, then you're lost. But if you make it about Christ, fixed on Christ in everything you do, then you're saved. It's like not messing with Texas. Has anyone heard that, don't mess with Texas? Do you know where that came from? An anti-litter campaign. That's where that term, don't mess with Texas, don't throw your trash out the window. In fact, it was Linda B. Johnson's wife, Lady Bird Johnson, who was one of the first and biggest proponents of stop throwing your trash out the window and try to beautify the United States. I don't know if anyone knows that, but that's another tidbit of information that you can have around the dinner table tonight. But it, don't mess with the kingdom of God. Do we want to be that obstacle that prevents people from coming to a relationship with Jesus Christ? Now, the great thing about being in the Reformed tradition, as we are, we know nothing we can do can prevent that. God is God. We can't, you know, overcome what God has already elected and chosen to do. However, sometimes we try. And when we try, it's like swimming with the millstone around your neck. And then Jesus says that. He says, those who lead others astray, it's better for you to have a millstone put around your neck and cast into the sea than what's going to happen when you stand before the throne. Now, that's definitely an admonition towards every preacher and teacher, but also towards every Christian. Because as I said earlier, the first sermon and witness and lessons people non-believers see is through the Christians, the behavior of the Christians they meet. Paul concludes our passage to say, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. I like this quote. Listen carefully to how people speak about other people to you. This is how they speak about you to other people. 
We've got to be conscious of how we speak. Because we all, like sheep, gone astray. We've all turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Jesus Christ took our sin on him, you know, because of what we have done. And we know there's no one here, you know, I love you all. I do. But myself included, there's no one here that's good. If we truly understand what good is, it says it not in just one psalm, but two psalms. The Lord looked down from heaven on the children of men to see if there were any who understood, who sought after God. They have all gone astray. They have, all, they have together become corrupt. There's no one who does good. No, not one. Yow. Woe be to us. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that he saves us. So we don't want to be blind guides. Remember what Jesus was, I mean, Jesus was saying to the Pharisee? You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. I bet some of you are wondering how I get to my sermon title. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. I want to leave it to your imagination what that means. But sometimes we can get over-obsessed with the differences than with the similarities. We can get over-obsessed with what makes us Presbyterian or Reformed as opposed to someone else who is a, who's not a Calvinist. Now, i got to tell you, I love being a Calvinist. I do. I like how it sounds. You know, when you say you're an Armenianism, sort of confusing, doesn't trip off the tongue, Calvinism does. But if we look at what Scripture says, Calvinism to me makes sense according to what Scripture says. The Armenian uh, thinking doesn't. But does that mean I think that those who are Methodist or uh, uh, Anglican or Episcopalian uh, or even Presbyterian who might not be Reformed or any other denomination who is, is not going to heaven because Calvinists have it all the right way? Absolutely not. Because I know no matter what I'm preaching, no matter what I'm teaching, when I stand before the throne, I know God's going to say, what were you thinking? Because we all sin and fall short of God's glory. But like, I would like to think we're all are seeking in God's way to proclaim who God and Jesus Christ is. And if we're doing that, then we're going the right way and doing the right thing. But we have to understand what we believe. That's so important. Think of something you believe is true. How sure are you that the belief is true? What is the source of the belief? What are your reasons for believing it's true? How could you figure it out if it's true? How would you feel if you were wrong? What evidence would change your mind? We need to do that with every verse of Scripture. And when we find out we're wrong, we need to be free and open to say, I'm wrong. I don't think this is right anymore. But we must hold to what we believe is true, knowing that it's God in Christ who gives us the ability to know it's true. And to show that truth, not with anger, but with love. Because faith is having the courage to let go and believe that God has this all under control. God is in control, we can trust him with everything. Christian brothers and sisters, that's the whole point. First and foremost, I'm a Christian. I was called to be a Presbyterian reform minister at this church. I am honored to be that. But however, I test the spirits each and every day, each and every time before I preach and before I teach. We all are called to do it because I don't want a millstone around my neck. I want to trust in what God has called us to say, trust in what God has called us to do, and proclaiming that truth to all that have ears to hear and eyes to see. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And that is why we gather around this table. We gather around this table because God has called us to be a community of faith. Yes, here at Lebanon, we are reformed. But across the way, there are Methodists, there are Catholics, there are others. As long as they believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, confess that with their tongue and believe in their hearts that God uh, uh, rose, I mean, raised him from the dead, resurrected him from the dead, they are saved. We are saved. 
let us in our tradition understand what we believe and in our tradition proclaim that truth but putting no obstacle in front of others but sharing our love and humility with all that come near. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this food and we thank you for the reality that you have saved us, you have redeemed us despite our sinfulness. You have saved us from your Father's wrath. We rejoice in that. Help us to be good teachers, good preachers, good Christians, and be a testimony and a testament to all that come near. Bless this food as we gather around this table. Bless us as a community of faith, united with Christians around the world who profess your Son, Jesus Christ as Lord, and believe that you raised him from the dead. We thank you for them, and we thank you for this time of togetherness we have. We ask all this in your Son's holy name. Amen. Christian friends were told on the night in which our Lord and Savior died. After giving thanks, he took a loaf of bread and broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. It says, This covenant is a new covenant in my blood for, for the remission of sins. For as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christian friends, the table is set. The invitations have gone out. Let's partake of this wonderful and joyful meal. I invite all those to come through the center aisle, come and take a cup, and return to your seats on the side aisles. You can certainly take enough for whatever group you're in, and then, you'll, and then for those on Zoom and later on on YouTube, and for those in the congregation, to take it as I direct. Let's now uh, partake of this wonderful meal. Christian friends, this is the body of Christ. Take and eat. This is the blood of Christ. Take and drink. Let us pray. Dear Lord, on this wonderful first day of the new year, we ask your blessings and presence. We thank you for your love for your people and for us. We ask you to be with us in a powerful way as we enter into 2023. Help Lebanon Presbyterian Church continue to be faithful and spirit-filled, focused on your word and focused on proclaiming your Son, Jesus Christ. All that have ears to hear, eyes to see, 
hands ready to receive and hearts ready to understand. Lord, we ask your blessings on the Tashwar and McGuire family as they continue to love and support Adeline. Be with Terry Nicholson. We, we rejoice that she's with us today. Let her health uh, continue to be strong. Let her not have her, a relapse of her uh, organized pneumonia because her parents need her. Be with her brother, Mark, who's having surgery on January 10th for chronic reflux and damage to his esophagus. And be especially with her father, Steve, who was diagnosed with uh, cancer, uh, both in his bones and his lymph nodes. Be with the entire family as they go to oncology appointment on Friday and let him meet whatever medical challenges you set before him. Lord, we ask you continued blessings on Bernie Hollis with his back pain and other health issues and with Tom Fox with his fluid retention and his fatigue. Bless them both. Be with uh, Tom's wife, Anne, as well as she faces a number of health issues. Be with Rich uh, Mills' uh, brother-in-law, Bob, who's not doing well. Be with Belinda uh, Ebert's uh, friend, Tony, uh, as he continues to recover from his illness. With Pam Mervis's friend, Steve, who has throat cancer. With Larry, who has leukemia, one of Bob Hawk's friends, and with uh, Nikki Hawk's grandmother, Barbara, who's recovering from a stroke. Be with Roger and Pat Nickel and their health issues. Be with Judy uh, Kaliznak, sister-in-law to Doreen Legg, who uh, is not doing well after her colon surgery. Be with the Carney family, especially Bethany, in her final days of uh, pregnancy. Let that go well. Let the, be born, the baby born healthy and, uh, healthy and well and the uh, labor go uh, seamlessly. Be with Mike's sister, Karen, who will be having a jaw surgery in the spring. With Donna, she continues with her infusions as they move to a new house and as they take a trip to Colorado to be with Bethany and uh, Andrew, their son-in-law. Lord, be with Jen Costa and be with her and her family. She deals with health issues she's facing. Continue to be with Andy Wonka as he recovers from his uh, motorcycle accident. We ask you also to be with uh, the nurse that he met uh, in the ER and her child. Uh, they're struggling, and even the individual who hit him. Be with uh, Patty Wonka as well as she's recovering from uh, the flu. Be with Leslie Hollimans uh, and her sister Lisa, who has cancer, and her father Bill, who has a number of health issues uh, as well. Be with Nina Garden as she recovers with, uh, from foot surgery with Katie Waggett, with Dorothy McKinney, with the Bender's friend Lillian. Uh, be with John Weber and be with Tommy and Debbie Bekovac. Tommy with his health as he cares for Debbie and Debbie in the nursing home. Lord, be with Scott Ferringer's sister Susan who's recovering from a knee replacement surgery and with Sue Ferringer's sister's uh, music director at North Park, uh, Brooke, who is recovering from illness as well. Lord, we ask your blessing on the Stoby family as they mourn the passing of Russ, as we mourn the passing of Russ. Be with uh, Charlie Brooks as, his, as he continues to struggle in certain areas with grief. Be with Adam Emil as and his Aunt Vicky as she deals with pancreatic cancer. Be with Dan Yaki as he is, uh, has an appendicitis and as he's recovering from uh, that aspect. And uh, be with him as he uh, looks uh, forward to surgery and give him a health, health, healthy recovery. Be with all those who traveled over the holidays. Be with all those who are still traveling. Be with those who are still getting COVID as well as some of the flu strains that are out there. Lord, be with those who are suffering from depression, anxiety, those who are confronted with difficult life decisions, those with private hurt and pain that can't be shared. Give them hope and assurance that you're there for them no matter what. Lord, be with our uh, city, with Pittsburgh and West Mifflin. Be with our country. Uh, protect uh, those in our society that are defenseless. Be with our police, our military, uh, who provides uh, uh, support and health, uh, help for us. Be with the peace and security for our nation. And Lord, be with us internationally as well. Be with Christians around the world who are suffering. Let us, uh, through our demonstration of love and humility, uh, bring peace. Uh, in a world that is at war. Lord, bless us in all things, and we thank you for your love and your presence, and be with us as we pray the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian friends, we have offering baskets in the back. We invite you, if you haven't already put your offering in, to do so when you leave, as well as those on Zoom and YouTube, if you'd like to send your offering in. We'd appreciate it as we, as a church, seek to share the good news of Jesus Christ, not just to West Mifflin, not just to Pittsburgh, but around the world. Let's pray. Dear Lord, bless these gifts, bless our time together, and bless uh, each one of us as we are a witness to your son, Jesus Christ, to all those who both believe and not believe. Let that be the offering we give you as well. In your son's holy name, amen.
Christian friends, as we leave this place today, let us know we leave as sermons and testimonies to all who know us, to all who see us. Let us not put obstacles in front of other people's faith. Instead, let us share our faith so that people know that we know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and that God raised him from the dead. Let us share that truth. Let us share that with us. Let us share that sermon with all that have ears to hear and eyes to see. And with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of God's Holy Spirit, be upon each and every one of us now and always. Amen.